So I think the way Russ and I are going to do this, we're going to tag team this section, and um, we have 20 slides or so, 20 or 22 slides, something like that, and um, we're going to go through those, and um, then we're just going to have Q&A. So, and if there's something in one of those slides that you want us to stop on and ask about, I think that's fine. So feel free to stop us along the way. And this is, um, this is uh, you know, non-scientific um, musings of writing grants for years, sitting on study sections, getting rejections, once in a while getting lucky enough to get one funded, and a number of the things we'll talk about probably apply to any grant that you might try to get funded, but we have particularly uh, slanted this toward, obviously, the topic for this meeting, DNI grants. And I'll just say before Ross dives in, um, in addition to those of you that are online looking at the slides, which we'll make available to you, you might want to look at, I'm trying to find, page 41 uh, is a nice synopsis of a paper by uh, one of Ross's colleagues about, uh, I don't know, it was something like uh, 10 key ingredients for getting writing and implementation research grant. Yeah. So you might want to make any notes or questions you have on that uh, as well yeah. as, as our slides. Yeah, and if we don't cover something on that list that you want to know about, then because we didn't really link our slides up to that list completely. These are kind of our musings, which I think is going to layer in quite a bit with what Enola came up with. Okay, so let's see. Nothing working here, Borsha. You want me to do the slides for you? I guess. Maybe. All right. I don't know why it's not working. Okay. So, have you ever seen this cartoon before? This black box cartoon? So, this applies to many, many different things in life. But in this case, the left side is you're doing this grant, you've got this great idea that could change the world. And on the right side, you got a score back, and it said you're going to get funded or you're not going to get funded. And there is a bit of a mystery in that middle part about what happens. And so what this is trying to do is help us to figure out when that miracle of funding happens, why, why it might have happened. Vanna, OK. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, so, so a couple of years ago, um, the, when they, so a while back, they changed the scoring system in NIH. And, and basically, it went to this one to nine scoring, where one is perfect and nine is horrible, and you know you're in between. And they tried to spread it out and make this better. And so that one to nine ends up being your impact score, which basically is whether you're going to get funded or not. And so what they did after the first 32,000 grants had been gone had had been reviewed, they went back and they did a regression analysis about which of these five subdomains, so these are the different subdomains where you're getting scored in your application, which of these subdomains are really predicting whether you're getting funded or not? And so what does this tell you where you want to put your emphasis? It's on the approach. And so the approach gets weighted almost sevenfold, significance three, then innovation, investigator, and environment, a little bit of a negative cor correlation. So little, little strange there. But, but it does tell you, and I think this is, what we would think if, if you sat through study sections, you get a bunch of researchers looking at methods, and what do they think they're going to sift apart? You know, think about it. All the areas you work in are likely to be significant, or you wouldn't be doing them. And you're going to probably have really good teams. Innovation's tricky. We'll talk about that a little. But, but approach is kind of what to focus on. So the key take-home message there is if you're writing like an increasing number of applications that are 12 pages or 6 pages long and you have to cut something, what's the last thing you cut? Methods. Okay, methods are the last thing that you cut. Because okay? kind of, that's what I always say, not described enough. Yeah, so, and it's, it's often kind of the last thing you write because the front sections, and so we often see like the significance being really long and that's, that's usually a mistake. And so, good point. And so... The first thing people see is going to, well, not the, the abstract, but, but the first kind of part of the application people see will be your AIMS page. And the, the AIMS page is, is, you know, the front part of it is kind of briefly walk them through the issue, why you're addressing this issue, the design you're using, and then the most important part, your overall goal and the AIMS. And there's different ways to set this up. 
keep the, you know, this is that old saying about you have one chance to make a first impression, and this is, this is sort of your first impression for your grant. Um, keep them realistic and, and don't use too many. I don't know about Russ, but if anything, when I see a grant, it's often, I barely see a grant with too few aims. So it's usually the other side where someone's writing, you know, a, a developmental grant and they have five aims or a, or, a, or an R01 grant and they have eight aims. And so, you know, you could often nest them together, but I try to get them to maybe three or four aims at the most. Um, and this is, you, you're, and the aims are where you're going to kind of walk them through and kind of measure through the whole application. Okay, so uh, other key point there is the word in italics, realistic. I think besides some kind of fatal methods flaw, the, one of the most common reasons that something isn't funded is considered overly ambitious. It's not realistic. Just given the team, given the money, given the experience they've had, it's just your, what you're proposing, just that you, don't, you haven't sold it, that, they're, that it's going to be feasible. And I've, and I've gotten to one other little thing that I learned actually from a cell biologist I, I was reading grants one day, and they, they organized differently. When I get to aim one, I'll give like a, a little rationale statement. Then I'll give the aim, and I'll say, to accomplish this aim, we have two activities. And so, and they're almost kind of bulleted little things. So each aim has its little section of its own. It's almost a little mini proposal of each aim. And, and, and look at other people's proposals you've seen, others you've written with, and sort of sift out the best ideas that you think make sense for yours. Question. So in terms of... Uh um, uh, I've heard, I think, there's a hundred something like that. <laughs> or is it just completely off? Well, so that means for an R01, you're going to have five, I guess. So I, I guess, you know, I guess that's a rough rule of thumb. And I, I think, you know, I don't usually write an R01 with more than four. Um, just because I think, if you think about the approach, you know, you're limited in the pages now. And explaining how you'll address five aims is can be a lot, but but it may depend. Another question? Yeah. Just in terms of you have specific aims and hypotheses, how important do you think it is to actually have a hypothesis? You know, I think it depends. Um, like everything else. That's the answer to everything. Yeah, everything <laughs> it depends. Um, I think if you have some directionality, you can explain, and you have some hypotheses based on previous work, then it might make sense. If you're writing the first of its kind R21 measurement grant, where there basically is no literature, then I would not try to do. Would you write it as a research question, or would you just stick to writing an I do sometimes use research questions. And a lot of it, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of it ends up being what space I have left, because you can write up a whole series of research questions. I sometimes will do sample research questions or example research questions. If you're comfortable with hypotheses, I've only seen that backfire once, and that's when they get carried away and they have like 300 hypotheses. Yeah. But, but I don't think I've ever seen anybody get beat up or penalized for having a, it just takes a little more space. But sometimes it really helps clarify and get the reader you know, there too. But I think it's maybe more of a, a style thing or a disciplinary yeah. thing, some disciplines. But generally, you're not going to get in trouble. It's just you give up a little space, just like most things, as long as you don't get carried away with it. But you're fine in terms of seeing things with just aims without any hypotheses or a, a hypothesis or research questions. You could, you could be fine just with seeing aims? Yeah, usually. And I think, too, sometimes you might have a primary aim. And so you might want to put a little more meat on the bones for that one. You might have secondary aims that you don't have as much around hypotheses. It, but, but again, it has to be specific. You can get in trouble if it's not specific, and that's why hypotheses can help you. So, for example, you could either have a hypothesis that my innovative intervention is going to be better than this comparison condition hypothesis, or you can just say, I'm going to compare these two specific interventions on this outcome where kind of the hypothesis is, is implied that yeah, way. Or, but, but you need to be specific. Or you could just take that comparison and turn it into a question. Yeah. You know, does this condition do better than that condition? And I, I actually end up doing that more often just because in a lot of these areas, I don't, I don't really know what the hypothesis would be because I, I don't know the directionality of something up front. And then, and then we're going to start with the approach, even though that's not sequentially what you'd see next. And this is, the, this is the heart of it. This is most likely what's going to really drive your score overall. Um, and the design, I mean, this fits very well with what Borstika covered earlier. You know, match the design to the research question and then to the measures um, in the application. Make sure you 
attend to internal validity, which is what we often do well, and then make sure that you address external validity as well, which is, which is even more important in a DNI application. And here's a little, a little bit more on, on external validity. Um, often important, often missing in the literature. Um, there's good resources. Actually, Russ and, and Larry Green, West Coast Larry Green, have written <laughs> quite a bit about well that have you know nice checklists for external validity. And so while you don't have to go through all, what, 24 items there, you might use those domains to say, we're addressing these four main domains around external validity. And, and if you need any of those articles, if you don't have them, um, it'll easily we can get those for you. Um, and they, these are a few just examples of, of some of the external validity sorts of data that you might want to collect. Um, and that can also just be participation. If you think of sort of an ecologic framework, who's participating, this can layer well with a re-aim kind of a framework as well. I think this general contextual notion of who, what that says there is, is uh, an important uh, issue. And I think the first panel did a great job today, if you remember back to it, about talking about this, just the questions that even though they didn't use these words, I, I keep thinking particularly David uh, Goff was saying he'd always ask himself, well, can they do this in other places? Can they do this in other uh, primary care settings or is this so unique to mine? Um, I will tell you one thing, uh, just a uh, quick uh, self-referent. When I was at Kaiser, I often got beat up on proposals because they'd say, you're doing it, oh, well, you can do it in Kaiser, but that won't generalize anywhere else. So again, you need to think through issues like that and will this work or how broad of other places would this be able to work in? What kind of resources would other places need to, to adopt this? And this could link toward the front end of your application, there's a literature now called the scaling up of interventions or the scaling up of practices. And so if you think about that scaling up as the ultimate goal, we found something that worked in one setting, now we're going to scale it up over a whole state or a whole country. This is where that external validity sort of connects to that idea of scaling up. Questions? Question? Yeah. How do you measure should be at this point? So providing a few examples of how we will measure a concept, is it sufficient? And then how do you deal with the idea of participatory research when you don't exactly know what the intervention will look like or the measures because the participants will inform you? Yeah. It, it, it depends. Depending on the subject. I told you. I mean, how many times we'll say that? So this is like a drinking contest. So. See how many times it's like Sarah Palin winking. Her. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> it's late. Um, so, so for example, if it's a measures development grant, an R21 sort of grant, then measures being developed is that's what you're doing, and so that's part of that grant. If it's um, an R01 grant, and the rest of your grant really depends on having reliable and valid measures then you probably need to show some of that pilot work up front or at least some indication that now now I have had you know bigger grants where there was still a measurement development phase at the front but we had a pretty good idea of what we were doing going in so it, I think it sort of matters what the stage of the of the uh, of the research is it's a tricky one and it really does depend like I think if you're going to PCORI versus NIH what you generally don't want to go is in something for your primary dependent variable where you're not sure you don't want to go and say well I know it could be this or it could be this that's that's usually the kiss of death so for that but some of the other things like your measures of context I think in my experience if you give them concrete examples you'll say we'll work on this we'll refine it but here's an example as of today so you kind of want to show your work, even if it's not all the way, you know, work, worked out. Yeah. Okay. And then the framework thing I think we've covered pretty well. Have a framework. That's the way to start. Link it all the way through. And we sort of said this this morning, I think. Um, and, you know, the TABIC thing isn't the only way to go, but it's a, it's a, good, it's a decent starting point. Um, I was talking to the group over lunch a little bit about, you know, I think the biggest limitation in this article is we did not try to go a lot into other literature outside of health. And, yeah. and if you're working in policy or working in quality improvement or other areas, 
the business literature might give really valuable guidance or the like we're using one grant where we're using um, some some theories institutional theory which came out of economics and business and so sometimes if you want to and, and this is where the Tabak article we did a little of that but we did not do any kind of systematic look at at non-health literature we'll get to innovation later often if you can apply some theory from another field and say this is the first time to our knowledge is being applied on this health medical topic public health topic often that will score you good innovation points so that's the only part of this I would link and then making sure that the I think Russ already said this this morning that it's not just a framework you dropped in never to be seen again that, that it's linked all the way all the way through the proposals from the aims to the activities and the measures and the and the analyses and that's probably one of the most important take-home messages in this whole slide set we have for you is yeah. that one again they're looking for consistency so it makes a coherent picture and what you said about the significance you'll see that show up somewhere in the measures uh, it's you know it's in the aims and then the analysis there's analysis that addresses it and then more on the approach you know who are you where are you working? Do you have access to those settings? How are you recruiting participants in the study? Those, this could be, you know, practitioners. They can be actual, um, actual community members. If you're, if you're doing a study like that, how are you going to sample? Um, why did you choose these settings in the first place? Have you worked with these settings before? So your experience showing the access. Um, this is where, you know, letters of support. You know, working in schools, for example. Schools are tough to work in, so do you have a track record doing that? Can you get sample letters from a bunch of schools? Um, if you do get letters showing you have access, don't use one form letter that everybody just signs the same letter and puts it on their letterhead. <laughs> what I do with the letters, I, I get everybody on my team and say, you're writing two letters, you're writing two letters, and so we all write them a little bit differently, and then we provide them to, the, to, to our stakeholders, and so they look different because you know, you can tell really quickly if it's one form letter that everyone's like, that's still better than no letter at all, but, but you want it to look, you know, like someone took some attention to this. Um, and then this, this sort of, get, you know, getting at this participatory thing, which I don't think I really answered very well before, how are you engaging partners? How are you using that as, to inform your study? Again, the external validity comes in again, and then um, the pilot data, depending on the reviewers in the study section, might not call it title data, but but you know the feasibility that you can do this is is probably very important in the bigger grants, the R01 grants, and the you know the multi-million dollar or the 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 multi hundreds of thousands of dollars a year grants. Yeah. I think the things on this page are really maybe kind of unique to DNI. Most everything else we talked about probably applies to most other things, but this notion of the setting and having thought through that and the partnership issues and that sort of thing are really uh, kind of critical. Somewhat, not that they're not relevant to others, but there's a much greater emphasis on it and particularly the engagement thing if you're doing a PCORI grant. And, and that, that engagement often, especially for PCORI, needs to be multi-level. Needs to be, think about the re-aim example we just did. It needs to be with the system, with the provider team, and with the patients. Okay, not, not just, just one of them. And I would think about, you know, engagement can take a lot of different frames. So do you just have some advisors who represent your stakeholder groups? Do you engage them all the way along? Are they paid part of your teams? Um, when I work with practitioner groups on any grant that I can possibly afford it, I pay people, I give subcontracts, I make it look like it isn't just all the money showing up at the university and we're asking other people to volunteer their time. So, so think about that and, and, and some of your groups will, will basically not play ball unless you do that, but we should think of it first and not, not say, oh, by the way, did you think about maybe you should give a subcontract by organization? And these bigger grants, you could do that and it, it does show a more, you know, there, there's, there's always in these participatory projects this balance of power, and the truth is, whoever's getting the money has most of the power. But you need to do whatever you can to, to equalize the, the power relationships that, that exist, so that it truly is a partnership. And then we have measures, and we're, we're talking a fair about a me about measures in this project. Uh, project, and um, you know, think about the, the variables you're trying to measure. Um, the importance of those, so if it's your primary aim, 
then all these issues around feasibility, reliability, and validity are probably more important. Um, the, you know, are we asking people to fill out 300 item questionnaires? Or are they things that are kind of user friendly and, and practical for people to fill out? And are you providing sample measurement tools in the appendix? And are they realistic? Um, and then the issues of adaptation of the measures. Most of the projects I work on, there aren't you know, ready off the shelf measures, but there are measures you can start with. So you're, you're often adapting those and, and working those through. Since I don't have anything uh, intelligent to say about this, I'll just tell you what the little thing in the bottom right is, in case you're wondering. Uh, this is adapted from a presentation Ross actually did at another uh, DNI training program that some of you might want to think about if you get in this area. It's sponsored by the VA and the NIH together uh, once a year in the summer, assuming the government isn't shut down, but it's an intensive immersion, uh, week-long training uh, experience, and it's a, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, actually, uh, you get everything provided, and maybe or maybe not travel, but all your room and lodging and all the materials and access to generally world class faculty almost on a 24 hour basis. Yeah. And then the analytic methods, again, linking those all the way through. If you're doing a quantitative project, make sure you have some kind of a, a power calculation to justify your sample size. And even though in qualitative work, you're not doing a sample size, a power calculation in the same way, still so, show a rationale for why you're reaching people. And maybe the sample size calculation is, we're going to start with 10 people and we're going to keep going till we reach saturation, or something else that a qualitative researcher can help you work through and, and understand and make sense. And, and for those of us who were re really never trained in qualitative methods, this is where it really pays off to partner up with someone who has that expertise um, so that you so that you get it right because there are often you know in a proposal that has three or four reviewers there will be one of those reviewers who really knows qualitative methods and you want to make sure you don't say something that doesn't make any sense and then this mixed method part is important and and not just that you did both things but how the data fit together and how they can be integrated or how one builds on the next one and, and really think about it deeper than just you know, we've got some quantitative data here, we've got qualitative data here, but they don't really connect up very well. I'll just add one thing that isn't on this slide is that in general, this is really a, uh, a transdisciplinary game and multiple disciplines. And so usually, and most people probably wouldn't think about going in for a large grant without a statistician of some type playing along. But similarly, if you're going to do a cost analysis, you probably do want to have if not a full-blown health economist, at least as a consultant or an actuary or, or something like that. Or, but in general, what you want to do is demonstrate that someone on your team has the requisite expertise for the different areas that you're, uh, that you're getting into. That's a good point. And then this one can be important, especially in a, this is maybe another one, like Russ said, that is especially important in a DNI grant. So this is kind of that management and dissemination plan. Not dissemination research, but we're gonna, here's how we're going to manage our project. Here's what we're going to do with our results. I often talk about a translation and dissemination phase, where translation is we're thinking about these stakeholders. Here's how we might reach you know, health department people. Here's how we might reach policymakers. We're usually really good at reaching other academic people. That's usually one you don't have to worry too much about. But the other audiences, thinking about those and thinking about how you're going to reach out to them, what messages might look like, and then how you'll reach them. And this is a part that, you know, it's not a separately scored part of the application. Actually, it is in some, some CDC grants and some of the R25 training grants. This, this section is actually a separately scored component. But in a DNI grant, the study section tends to look more closely at this. And this is one place where sustainability might fit in. It could fit other places as well. But this is this notion that, OK, what's next with what I'm doing? And what are some ideas about how it might be sustained? Not that you have to fund that or you can project out 15 years from now, but some ideas about that. And there, some agencies put a lot of stock in that part of it as well. Anything else? And OK. Then, we're going to uh, trade over. I'm going to do first, and then Ross will uh, add the points or correct me, which uh, I'm just kind of an interloper. These are actually his slides, so I'll probably get half of them wrong. 
Now we're going to go back to the first part, the significance, after your aims, your significance, your background, your, your context, selling them on the importance of, of what you're doing here. So the scope, and I think Ross makes an important point here in the, in the second point, uh, it's one thing to do attributable risk, like for example, you saw today, well diabetes, this many million people have it, it's this big of a problem, but also what's your likelihood you can do something about it? It's one thing to say it's a big, that's the idea of the preventive fraction based upon what we know about the evidence that people stop smoking, it might actually do, do, do this much uh, good. Uh, the notion that Ross talked about, about scale up again, if we were able to do this nationally, what we're studying in this, you know, we're doing a modest sized project, but if this were to be scaled nationally, this is what it could mean, you know, for the country or for uh, health care or whatever. Um, in my experience, the uh, third bullet point about review of the literature is where people get really hung up. You want to show you know the key studies, the classic studies, and probably recent studies. But I've seen so many people either waste six months trying to think they know every study that's been done, then they throw their hands up if a new one's been published or something. You don't have the space for that. That's not what this is. This is not an exhaustive, systematic review. Okay, it's showing that you know the key literature in the field with emphasis on the, on the key uh, there. And, and then focus on the gap. And so what you're selling is not only it's important here, but it's the gap between what's known. So I've just reviewed, I said it's important, okay? I've said here's the literature that exists, here's what isn't known, and then that leads into your study. Yeah, yeah I think that, and the third one, what I often start with, and it depends somewhat on the content area where you work, but think of a review of reviews so that Instead of going to the 100, 150 original research articles and reviewing those, start with systematic reviews or narrative reviews and review those on that third bullet. And then if there's still some gaps, you could go back to the original literature. But in most of our fields, there are reviews already out there. And so summarize the reviews, and that often keep, help, lets us sort of keep it brief because this is where you and, and this is where if, if you start off and it, and it looks too long, go back and cut this part. Um, I, I would say on almost every grant, this is where I end up cutting, cutting text out is in the, in the significance section. Yep. Again, if it's a forced choice between methods and significance, you want to cut significance. So uh, let me read the bottom here. Uh, the notion is defining what evidence base means. So it is a drinking game, Ross. Yes, we have I knew there was in there what, it, uh, what it says at the bottom is, then we're agreed that all the evidence isn't in, and that even if all the evidence were in, it still wouldn't be definitive. So more research is needed, right? That's what's just kind of, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add well, to that? Well, kind of? this is just, if you, if you, so if you look under the NIH DNI program announcement, this notion of evidence-based is all over it. And so what does that mean exactly? Does that mean there have been five systematic reviews done on it? Does it mean there's one or two good randomized trials? And there isn't, there isn't a magic definitive answer there. Um, I think, you know, set at least sort of a middle evidence bar and say, well, at least there's a few credible reviews, or at least there's a good body of literature, or maybe my parent agency, the, you know, the, the parent body for HIV AIDS prevention has designated this as an evidence-based practice, or something where some expert body has said this is evidence-based, and, and for at least the NIH version of DNI, that will help. Often uh, other things that will help a little bit is something like when a key prestigious group like the Community Guide Preventive Services Task Force comes out with a recommendation. And sometimes these aren't always evidence-based. As Linda knows, for example, in cancer survivorship, the IOM has come out with some things. Usually that's enough to carry the day, yeah. even though not all of those recommendations may be, may be evidence-based. But there's some other authority beside you that, that's kind of saying that, you know, we have a sufficient body body of evidence. But again, the true answer is, is it depends. And as Ross says, this is something that the field is, is working out. And is it, is it this exact intervention with this exact population? Or is it this principle? Or is this, this, this notion of diabetes prevention program? Is that it? Or is it your particular thing? We, we don't know. And you kind of have to make your case uh, to the study section. So innovation. Uh, this is kind of a tough one because it's a double-edged one because of what Ross just said. 
On the one hand, for a DNI grant, they want this to be evidence-based, so it has to be. So it's kind of hard to be truly innovative if it's already, you know, somebody already had to do it. So how am I? But but there's some twist on that and ways to think about uh, making a DNI grant innovative, even though it generally has to be evidence-based. Uh, one way is the study population. So. Uh, I think one of you had a good example today that the DPPs worked in general, but has it really worked in, you know, uh, well, Spiro's thing in uh, Native American populations? Or one of you, I think, ha is doing that in Latino populations. So taking something else, and particularly with, if you will, an underserved or more challenged population. Um, a second one is how you're going to adapt this. Okay, cultural adaptation, making it uh, culturally appropriate and, and, uh, and sensitive. Um, you can apply a new framework or approach, a new theory, uh, or, or not necessarily a new theory, but one of these theories that hasn't been used before. Like maybe um, Ross is a closet system science here. He's coming out a little more each year. year. Uh, but like applying complexity theory, uh, I think colleagues did the primary care a few years ago. It had been used in physics and basic science before. People hadn't used it to you know primary care and think about what are the implications uh, there. Anything else to add, Russ? No, and I said about the non-health theory before yeah. as well. And there may be other things you could think of. These are just some examples. And you know what Russ thinks is innovative may be right. different than mine. So what I usually do is line out like maybe four or five reasons. First, it's innovative because of that, and maybe the reviewer is going to buy two of them. But you know, <laughs> maybe they're not going to buy all of them. But but you know, kind of lay it out and. I've, I've read some grants where the innovation is all kind of mangled together and you don't exactly know what they're saying, but I say it's innovative first because of this, next because of this, next because of this, and, and lay it out as clearly as you can, and then let your team look at it and, and you know, see if it passes the laugh test with your team. <laughs> I'm curious about the non-health theory, especially, say, for NIH grants. Have you gotten positive reception for something so far outside of health? I have had good luck with that, and I, and I know others who have had, you know, large grants funded by doing that. Um, I suppose there's a risk at everything, but, and, and don't do something that doesn't fit, but if there's something, like I was looking at this institutional theory, and it had a lot of things in there about how it seems like health departments make their decisions, and so I said, okay, this is, and I sort of molded it with another more commonly used theory, and, and, and you know, the reviewers seem to buy it, so, you know. Not something that's, that doesn't really fit, but if, you, if you've got someone on your team or you're working, this is, gets to back to the transdisciplinary thing, if you're working with some other disciplines who, who say, you know, we've got something in our field that fits really well, if you thought about this. Uh, we used Kingdon's policy theory in, in one grant we did, and, and we modified it a little to kind of make it look more public healthy, but, but it, it seemed to work. Yeah, again, you know, the answer is it depends, and, and you have to sell. I mean, it's a sales job you're doing, but uh, uh, in general, like with Ross, as long as they can see the connection, like just a couple other examples Ross mentioned before, organizational theory. I've seen that do pretty well, people that know a different organization or a business theory, how they're applying. I mean, healthcare is a business, you know, to look at that. Um, I think I just lost my uh, other example. Oh, I know. A lot of uh, things that I saw rated high on innovation was applying like systems engineering from the engineering field to the healthcare. I saw that be rated as real, real highly innovative. Again, but we're not saying just do something different just because it's different. You know, it has to make sense and fit yeah, your, fit your problem there. Okay, so for PCORI or community-based community engagement uh, projects, the notion is Think about framing this as stakeholder engagement, and again, I would say generally for DNI, multiple stakeholder uh, engagement. And this is our the D4D is our acronym for designing for dissemination. I hope that's one of the take homes you're getting if you're not sick of hearing it already or today. You don't wait till the fourth and a half year of your five year grant and then say, well, now I'll think about maybe disseminating the results. You, you should be doing that from the beginning in partnership with your uh, with with your stakeholders and things. Ross, anything else on that? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So how do you deal with this in the grant? Because if you want to do the true partnership, then you are not going to deal with everything. Yes. 
I don't know we have any better answer than we did the last time you asked, uh, Borsica. Let us see. Let me think if there's a, there's a different one. It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, guys, is it enough to say that certain intervention, is it okay to say that certain intervention components will be refined or developed once we hear from the stakeholders, or is that going to be a no, I think it is, and something I do, I'm a little mixed with sharing it, but sometimes I do, and I've, I've gotten stung sometimes, but not always, is to have kind of a, a build-up year. I usually call it a refinement year rather than a pilot year or a working out. But again, the danger you run with that, if you play that up too much about we're going to develop all this, then they can say, well, you know, come back and write a, you know, an R21 or an R34, and then when you're ready for a real play with the big boys, come on back then and see. Yeah. There, so, so it's it's walking a, a fine line. But I think my own gut level is, and again, I don't know. I, I've never reviewed for Picori. I don't know if Ross has. Maybe I know you have, Borsica and, and others. But I think Picori may be a little looser on that because of this importance and looking more willing to accept that than would traditional NIH study sections. But you could probably respond to that better than I could, actually. But um, but but it's a it's a fine line. But again, I think the. The issue is giving them, even if it's an example, a specific concrete example so you demonstrate that you're familiar with the issues that you have something in mind. And it's not just, oh, we're just going to get together and, you know, we'll make up something, you know, as we go along. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, have a plan. <laughs> that sounds like the drinking party. Even, yeah. <laughs> even if that's the truth. But <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and maybe we'll have a good answer by the time we're done here. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll try. We'll <laughs> right there, you go. Third time, third time's a charm. Maybe you'll get a decent answer. <laughs> okay, um, often we get asked because life isn't easy, and often there's an issue about should I go for a smaller grant like an R21, an R03, an R34? They're different ones, or should I go for the whole banana, a big grant, an R01 or an R34? In general, it's, uh, it's a little easier to get funded, particularly if you're a younger investigator. Uh, maybe the standards aren't quite as high uh, for you to get funded on a, on a smaller grant or if, if there's a question. Um, but, but there's no, again, it's the answer is it depends. It, it just depends on the status of the field, of the team that you have. If you are a young investigator and you want to go for a large one, it usually pays off to have an experienced investigator as a partner or whatever uh, in that or think about a co-I situation or something. The downside is, in, again, in my experience, the small grants are often exactly the same amount of work, almost identical the amount of work that you have to do for a large grant. So sometimes I say, you know, let's just go for it as well as I'm just impatient. So I don't want to wait two years to do the small grant and then revise that, you know, and go another year to do that. But, but again, it kind of comes down to often how big a risk taker are you, and there's no right answer uh, to that. You want to say anything about I'll, that before I go to the other points? I guess the second and third bullets, almost always when I'm get right helping someone get their first big grant, they almost have the, the team is too big. They're adding all these senior people, yeah. and, and they're never going to be able to get them together for a meeting anyway. And so, so you know, don't don't leave out any key disciplines. But I would say always there if you're thinking about should I add two more people or keep it where it is? It's often keep it where it is, and then usually starting out. More often, people are trying to do too much than too little. So that kind of gets back to the aims we, we talked about. Those two things sort of link together. Yes? I think, like, the things you care about at a senior level, mm -hmm. you might need to add a much senior or senior yeah. level. Yeah. Because if you're more of a junior investigator, then probably you need to bring further senior. Yeah. Because they like to see it as we have a I would say that's true, but although, you know, you may be better off funding more of one or two senior people than five or six small percentages, and yeah. that's, I agree, you need to have that, that balance of junior and senior, but what I often see is we have five people with 5% time, and unless they're really key to it, I would say, you know, reduce that down to 
two people with 10 percent time. Yeah. Otherwise, that raises management issues, particularly if they aren't at the same location. But the yeah. other, the other issue, just the pragmatic issue, is since they haven't changed the budget caps, you know what, since 1850 or whatever, you know, on that, and you get a number of senior people, you don't have much money left to do the work. The people that are actually going to do the work. Yeah. So a lot of that's just a, a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic issue there. Another one we probably should have put in italics. Use the tables and the figures. That often can convey it. Really really is worth probably at least a thousand words, okay, of your text. They have a good solid figure or a text. And those, as Ross said, the things I would work over and show to different people until I get it right are the tables, the figures, and the specific games. Those I would go through multiple times, show them to people that don't know what you're doing and see where do they get confused or where are they not able to follow. Anything else, Ross? No. Okay. Uh, I think good examples, if you can, uh, is to uh, do the, the first two things. I know a number of uh, institutions are trying to do this. Uh, because more people are getting onto this, it used to be kind of novel, or doing either mixed study sections or experience reviewers. Sometimes the, uh, the pay to play comes in, and so now people are sometimes expecting to be paid a little bit if they're, if they're not your colleagues at the same institution for doing this. But, but often it really does help. Partic uh oh, what happened here, Borsica? No video input. Uh oh. Oh, you don't? Okay. Well, thank you. Hey, I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, I got the, the blue screen of death here. So was I done? No. Uh, study section, okay. Uh, well, you know, we have a few, uh, a few things to make you feel better here. We can empathize and then go drinking together here, so uh, at the end. I think this notion of an experienced reviewer uh, does help because just they can anticipate the types of questions that uh, come up. Uh, and again, uh, we'll come back to this, but the uh, article you have summarized and the points there by NOLA, and we'll kind of check to see if you have any question about that. That's great. The NCI website does have on there uh, both successful grants and characteristics of successful grants, if you look that, and I think that's in your notes. If not, we'll make sure that you get it on the NCI Implementation Science Study section. And maybe most helpful of all, within, I'm going to guess, two months, the folks at university, I've learned being back in Colorado, Ross, it's not just you. I used to say UNC, but UNC, you know what that means. So here, that means Northern Colorado. Yeah, yeah. UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, is putting together what I think is really going to be a state-of-the-art website for DNI and implementation science, and they're going to include a number of full proposals and things. They've asked leading scientists from around the country, and we'll maybe send out something when it's ready. They're kind of piloting it now with showing it to a bunch of people, but you might want to look at that in a, in a couple months, so it'll be a great resource. <laughs> um, and then the last point is really important. I can't tell you, particularly when I was at NIH, and I used to hear NIH officers before I went over to the dark side say this, this last point, please be a reviewer. And maybe I'm sure Ross wants to address this too, but it, it really is critically important. This is how our field advances. And I can't tell you, you know, how many people like to sit back and fold their arms, oh, it's a screwed up system, and I got ripped off, and, you know, it's just the third reviewer, everybody else is fine. It's a, but, but, you know, the two things are, I do think we have an obligation, and actually a number of institutes now are starting to take you up on that, particularly if you're funded. It's, it's an expectation to go in there. And also, I'd say particularly, you know, for those of you that, uh, you know, are a little younger than, than Ross and I. I mean, I think that's the way, that's really what Thomas Kuhn said, you know. Science paradigms change when the old guard dies off, you know. It's, uh, it isn't really any big aha that, that people have there. But, but it, it's really important uh, when you, you get these opportunities and things to do that. And it's also valuable for you because you kind of get to see the sausage being made up front. And you'll see some of these issues that Ross and I are trying to tell you secondhand about. So it's, uh, we, we strongly would nominate you and not be bashful about, about volunteering yeah. either. And you can self-nominate, so yeah. there's an early career review at NIH, and then the other, you, so that's formally, and, and I've heard from people sometimes that's kind of a long, a long process before you hear back. You do eventually hear back, but depending on, you know, what the government's doing at the time. Uh, the other part is if you know someone in your institution who's on study section, oftentimes they're looking for ad hoc reviewers, and 
I've had really good luck just to say, you know, so and so, could you use an extra reviewer? And they they often can't go to that. So a, 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 the SRO, the the review officials who kind of manage the review groups, they often have two or three of these. So they can't populate the same review section with multiple people from the same institution, but they can get other like review panels. And so take advantage that way if you if you want to. And it's a really if you haven't been on a panel before, you really do learn a lot. It's it's a lot of work, but it's worth the work, and it's also, as Russ said, an obligation for us. You know, when people complain, you know, well, that's the other saying is, you know, we met the enemy, and the enemy's us, because we're the ones who decide what gets reviewed and funded by by these study sections. And so, if if we're <coughs> upset about you know not not getting enough grants funded, um, then it's it's on us to to make that happen. Yeah. And uh, not to wave the flag too much, but I think uh, having traveled some internationally, and Ross or others may have Borsica more perspective on this than I do, but frankly, you know, it's far from a perfect system, but generally if you look at the way it's done in the rest of the world, which is still largely a good old boy system, you know, an insider and who knows who, it's, it's probably better than the alternatives, as, as imperfect as it is, you know. Doesn't mean we don't need to continue to, to work on it. Okay, uh, resources here. You'll have these on your slides. Uh, we could maybe look at Enola's, but I think we've got uh, maybe 15 minutes for your questions or until the, until the group you comes. The oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got the, uh, the fun stuff. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'll let you do this, Ross, since this well, is so yours. This is the yeah. fairness. If it doesn't feel fair, it isn't always fair. This is the one about for fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb the tree. <laughs> and so somebody's going to win, and, and maybe that tree is, you know, maybe the experienced investigator is going to win out a little more, but that, that happens. And then I made this next one. Okay, the next one, Russ. I had something to say about that, but you I did? forgot what it is, so I think I'll go ahead. What was it? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's a fish out of water or something. I'll think of it later. Let's, let's go ahead. But... And this used to be only the Cardinals, but I, I managed to <laughs> update it. If you're a hockey fan, we got the Miracle on Ice. If you're a gymnastics fan, we got the, the women's gymnastics team. And then if you're a Cardinals fan, I'm probably the only one here. Although Elaine is not here. She's a, oh, you're a fan? All right. So if you remember the 2011 World Series when we were out of it, well, miracles can happen. And that does happen with grants. My example there is I got a, a grant back several years ago that got not discussed the first time through. Wow. And um, we debated, and I actually conferred with Russ and others about, you know, is this worth even reapplying for? This is a lot. You know, writing the, the, the second round is a lot of work because, it, you know, it's basically like writing an article revision, but a lot more work than that. But discussing with them, it seemed like there were, you know, a couple things in there that were fixable, and we, we wrote it, and we resubmitted it, and got almost a perfect score the second time through. And that was my miracle. That was my, my sports metaphor here, is that sometimes you can, you can get it back through the second time through, even though when it looks like it's hopeless the first time through. So, you know, you have to look at that and say, are there fixable things here? But, but sometimes it can be that way. And there's probably well other other miracles you could put up there, but for the sports fans, and those of you who are not sports fans, sorry about that. <laughs>